so uh, in the previous class we were we, I, I, we, we learned about sequential quadratic programming, which is to solve a constraint optimization problem. And one of the things that was sort of left hanging, it wasn't clear, is why the statement of this sort, uh, minimum of F naught, This is part of sequential quadratic programming. So I have this problem, minimize x in capital X. Uh, um, let me write it as a claim. I, I want to solve the following problem. Minimize x in x, f naught of x plus max of f1 of x, f2 of x is equivalent to minimize x in x, c in r, f0 of x such that f1 of x less than equal to c, f2 of x less than equal to c. Okay, so this was the last question that we were discussing in the sequential quadratic programming. Uh, and I think someone asked, I think Matthew asked, why should this be true? Okay, this is something we used in sequential, in deriving the sequential quadratic program for solving constrained optimization problem. Okay, all of you remember? This is where we were stuck in the previous class. It was towards the end of the class. So, how do we prove, oh, there has to be plus she here. So how should we prove that this holds true? So let me start with a very simple problem. I want to minimize C such that A is less than equal to C and B is less than equal to C. A and B are constants in R. What is the solution to this problem? Okay, this minimum is overall C in R. No, it doesn't. Okay, A and B are real numbers. But if, if C is greater than zero. Okay, let him finish first and then I'll get back to you. If C is greater than zero. Right. <coughs> and if all we know about A and B are that they're less than that, then A could be the biggest positive number and B could be the biggest, the highest magnitude negative number that's allowed. Uh -huh. And so then that would be our minimum. The minimum of A and B? Minimum of, is it the minimum of A and B or minimum of A times B? So you are saying it should be minimum, okay, so answer one is minimum of, no. You what? What's your answer? It's the minimum value of C such that A and B are less than that. Well, that's the question. <laughs> <laughs> what's the answer? What's the C star? I want to find C star. What's the argument? Okay, maximum of A and B, okay. So one answer is max of A and B. Matthew had an answer? Oh, I agree with that answer. Okay, so Matthew came up with the answer max of A and B. Someone else came up with the answer max of A and B. I want some other contenders as well. So who wants to give this problem a shot? Yes? If we're throwing out answers because that's the right one, I'll just go with zero. <laughs> uh, Okay. <laughs> any other any other thoughts? How many of you don't agree with this answer? Okay. How many of you agree with this answer? 
<laughs> okay. And many people don't know or can't say. Uh, okay. Um, so indeed, this is the correct answer. So this is max of A and B. So the optimal solution, arg min, is max of A and B. And actually, the solution minimum is also equal to A is less than or equal to C and B is less than or equal to C. Okay, so the value is also this and argmin is also the same, of course. Okay, and why should this be true? So let's say C was greater than max of A comma B. Then certainly I can reduce the value of C so that A is less than or equal to C and B is less than or equal to C. And therefore, the argument must be equal to the max of these two numbers. It can't be less than B because it will violate this constraint. It can't be between A and B because it will violate this constraint. Um, and so it has to be, it has to be um, a value above greater than or equal to A, and A certainly minimizes the objective function. So it's max of A comma B. OK, any question? There was a question in the back. No. OK, so all of us agree with this. Agree with this uh, particular claim or this particular fact. OK, it's not very difficult to prove. So we want to use this idea in this particular problem. OK, so I have max of two functions. And I put those two functions in the constraints with less than or equal to C term, and then add C here. And these two problems become equivalent. So let's see how, uh, how we did that. Yes? Is there a reason we're not just splitting it up into two minimization problems, and then taking the minimal minimization problems? Because uh, is the constraints containing one of the variables we're moving over the cloud and clouds the normal minimization process. So you want to split it into two minimization problems. And you can just say the, the uh, uh, min of x in capital X, x of, of x in capital x, of x0 of x plus uh, f1 of x, and then it's f1 of x, whereas f2 of x. Because we're getting into a conflict there Uh, I don't. Okay, so I, I. So you disagree with the claim, or? No, no. I'm, I'm saying uh, we're going to wind up in an unusual circumstance, and it's aware C has to be greater than a function that we're also determining in the same minimization problem. Oh yes, yes. So of course here there is no variable, right? But the idea is transferable to this problem. So it's not. Uh, let's get to the proof, and then you will see why these two are equivalent. So I don't think you are, um, um, so, so I think, um, let's, let's look at the proof, OK? Any other question? No? So I want to do minimum over x and x. So let me consider this problem. Minimum over C in R, F naught of X plus C, such that F1 of S is less than or equal to C, and F2 of X is less than or equal to C. OK? This is equal to minimum of X in X, F naught X plus minimum over C, C in R, F1 of S, X is less than or equal to C, and F2 of X is less than or equal to C. OK? The reason why I could switch the, so first of all, when I have minimum over X and minimum over C, I could take the minimum in any order. It doesn't matter, right? Um, and so if I take minimum over C uh, first, 
I know that this function does not really depend on xi, so I could pull it out and this depends on xi and then the constraint depend on xi, so I can put the constraint along with this minimization problem and what I have is minimum x in capital X f naught of x plus max of f1 of x and f2 of x okay uh, and that this max comes from here you know this implies this okay is that clear yes attempting to split the minimization and over x as in two substatements where everything after it is still held in a giant parenthesis that you've omitted or are you saying there are two separate problems? No, these are not two separate problems. Okay, so let me put a parenthesis here. Okay. So this constraint depends on c and x but once I fix the value of x this is its own minimization problem that can be converted into a max of two functions then I add it to f naught of x and then I take the minimum over x okay so is that clear makes sense and then you can have any number of functions here and it still makes perfect sense okay there is nothing nothing specific about two functions you can have n such functions and it will still work Okay. Questions? Okay, so this is also uh, something really cool. So if you have a min max problem, you can put the maximum part in the constraint, and what you have is a constraint minimization problem. Okay, so that's useful in uh, game theory if some of you are familiar with it where you solve min max kind of problems so so yeah, it has some applications in other other areas of optimization as well any other question any further concerns questions okay so, yeah then how do we evaluate in the c a implementation statement because uh, I mean f1 and f2 of x is given it's just that you can't get the maximum of two functions in a closed form so and this is minimum over xi so xi is part of the optimization problem so uh, are we just going to then treat the minimization of c as a sub problem and be running it for every value of x oh no 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 so you give you give this constraint minimization problem into MATLAB or whatever your favorite software is and it automatically gives you the optimal value of x and optimal value of c. But how from a theory perspective if, if, if we needed to do it by hand when we solve it? And, or is this purely something that it requires a method we're not going to solve? So if the problem is simple enough that you could solve it by hand then this is exactly how you would solve it so for every value of x you will find what c what the solution to this problem is which is actually max of f1 of x and f2 of x you will add it to f0 of x and then do the minimization over x okay so um, but certainly if the problem is complicated you give this optimization problem to MATLAB or whatever your favorite solver is and then it will give you the value of x as well as the value of c. <coughs> maybe this isn't part of that question, but um, at least for my money, how if I've got two functions and I know I'm considering them over, uh, I, I don't know what the input value is, right? then how do I actually determine what the maximum is? Is it just a matter that of saying, that, well, on its entire domain, this function is above this other function, so this one's the maximum? Or no, so you could have. So you could have f1 of x like this yeah. and f2 of x like this. Then certainly the max of the two functions will be will be this. 
right? Uh, so either you get the function in analytical form, add it to f naught of x, and then do the minimization, or you just put these two functions in the constraint, and then solve this, solve this problem numerically. Okay. Now going back to the sequential quadratic programming, where we had this problem. I want to minimize x in R n, f x plus c, p x. Okay, this p is capital P. So how do I solve this problem? Well, I have xk plus 1 equals xk plus alpha k dk, and dk equals to argmen c greater than equal to 0, d in rn, gradient fxk transpose d plus half d transpose h d plus c c and gradient g j x k transpose d plus g j x k less than equal to c for all j. Okay, this was our problem. So the optimal value of c doesn't really appear anywhere in the in the direction. Okay. And this is a quadratic program. And that explains why this is called sequential quadratic programming. So you have a penalty function for violating the constraint and then you have the original objective function. You converted the constraint problem into an unconstrained problem. And then you, then we figured out what's the optimal direction D in which we want to descend. And we took the first order Taylor series expansion of that. And that converted this whole algorithm into a, the gradient descent algorithm into a sequential quadratic programming problem. We get the optimal DK. We pick alpha k according to whatever is your favorite alpha k picking rule, minimization rule, limited minimization rule, or Mio's rule. And then you take a step in that direction and then redo the, redo the computation with xk plus 1 everywhere. Okay, h is some positive definite matrix. Uh, if you want to be creative, you can keep the positive definite matrix as the uh, second derivative of the objective function or second derivative of the Lagrangian and things like that if you if you know what they are otherwise you can just take h to be identity that's completely fine okay now the question that we have to answer uh, something that's not still answered is how do you pick the value of c okay so c doesn't uh, so we not we need to know so What's the constraint on C? Well, C has to be greater than summation of absolute value of lambda i star plus summation of absolute value of mu j star i and sum over all j. Uh, actually, this is all this is all uh, inequality, so there is no lambda i star. So I want the sum to be over mu j star, absolute value of mu j star. But I don't know mu j star, right? I, I haven't solved the problem, so I don't know what mu j star is. So how do I pick a value of c, uh, value of c? So here is the idea. Okay, a lot of people are feeling sleepy in the class. <laughs> That's not good. Yes. So, 
So here, yes, this is the constraint on D. This is the gradient of gj transpose d plus gj of xk is less than or equal to c. g is given, yeah, these are the in inequality constraints. d, c, c, yeah, that's what we are discussing. How do we know what the value of c should be? Oh, c, okay. <laughs> c is part of the optimization, part of the uh, variables over which the minimization is taking place. So it's given. What do you mean by is given? Mm, it's not a constant, it's a variable within the optimization problem. I see, so that's the, the second constraint constraint of C. <coughs> it's a constraint on D as well as C. So if you want to rewrite the constraint, it would be gradient of GJ transpose D minus C is less than or equal to minus GJ at XK. Right? That would be a constraint over D and C. In fact, you can be a bit more creative and you can write GJ transpose 1 D C is less than or equal to minus GJ XK. Okay, so this is in a linear constraint over the joint vector D comma C. Okay. So going back to the question, how do we pick C? So here is an idea. So there is quite a bit of complexity in implementing this algorithm, but I just want to simplify the basic idea uh, and then hope that whenever you encounter this problem, you can go back to the book, refer to the algorithm and see how it gets implemented. Uh, so the basic idea is, to begin with, when you have x0, you get the value of d0 by setting argmin d in rn. So I'm going to set c equal to 0 of whatever the optimization problem is. Okay, so I'm going to set c equal to 0. And corresponding to every inequality constraint, I'm going to get mu j comma 0 okay star so once i plug it plug this optimization problem in i am setting c equal to 0 so this term will vanish so there is no dependence on c anymore and this term will be equal to 0 and then i get the value of mu j 0 star corresponding to these inequality constraints and I am going to take C K or C1, C1 to be equal to <coughs> summation of mu J0 star plus some gamma where gamma is greater than 0, J equals 1 to R. Okay. That gives me the first, sorry? You don't take an absolute. So oh, because mu j0 star is always going to be positive uh, because it's an equality constraint. Okay, so that gives me the value of C1 and then I solve the same problem with X1 by getting d1 equals to argmin of the whole thing with c equals to d 0 and argmin is over d in rn. And then I get the value of c2 equals to summation mu j 1 star plus, uh, sorry, there should be a max here, max of c1 comma summation mu j 1 star plus gamma, summation over all j, and so on. Okay, so initially, you're going to pick c equal to 0 all the time. Yeah. Corresponding to these inequality constraints. 
when x k is equal to x zero. Okay, so at let me write it here. <coughs> when when you have x k here, the corresponding Lagrange multipliers, I am going to define them by mu j k star, corresponding to this inequality constraint. Okay, and so whatever solver you are using, it will it will be able to give you what the corresponding Lagrange multipliers are. And then all you have to do is sum it up, add a positive number, and then pick C1 equal to that. Sorry? There was a question? No. So C2 will be max of C. So remember, C has to be greater than this sum, right? So we just have to keep increasing it. Uh, Because this could be, so remember that this is not, so whatever this number is, it may not be greater than this actual number. So you have to keep increasing it. So any value of C greater than this threshold is fine. Any value of C. So you keep increasing the value of C until C becomes greater than this number. Okay. then you shouldn't be increasing. Yeah, but you don't know what this threshold is. You have to be above certain threshold, but you don't know what the threshold is. So how would you know whether this is the threshold, this is above the threshold, or this is below the threshold? You wouldn't know. The algorithm wouldn't know. So you have to keep increasing it until something happens, okay? Oh, no, I just answered this. So this is inequality constraint less than or equal to. So the corresponding Lagrange multiplier will always be positive. I mean non-negative. Yeah. No, not solely for the first case, for all the cases. This is an inequality constraint less than or equal to C. Okay, so you'll always have positive uh, or non-negative Lagrange multiplier. Yes. So and what does the choice of C in this way give us for it's improvement sufficiently that I don't just pick C as one moment in the moment. Uh, does it positively impact performance that much? Because we're requiring another entire optimization pump with every step you know, to get more accuracy, and we don't have yeah, so on the computer problems in general. Yes, so that's exactly what the implementation details that's there in the book. So if you pick C equals 1 million, you're guaranteed to be, or not guaranteed, but you're likely to be greater than this sum. Um, but the, I want to, um, okay, so if C is equal to 1 million, you have a problem in picking an appropriate value of alpha k. Okay, so whenever you do minimization or Armijo's rule, you you have to go through multiple iterations in order to get an appropriate value of alpha k. So having a very high value of c doesn't really help you because your computational complexity of this step goes up in implementation, okay? But theoretically, you can have one million and you can run gradient descent and eventually you will get to x star. But in the implementation, it's either k that or Right, later. yeah. Um, so you keep increasing the value of C in this fashion until the optimization routine says that, look, this problem is infeasible because there is no D that satisfies all these constraints simultaneously, okay? So in that case, you again put C back into the game with this C goes back into the game. So remember, we are keeping C equal to zero all the time until we hit that particular moment, and then after that, we, in, we remove this constraint of c equal to zero. So let's say at x 500, oh, not x 500, but d 500, I have to do argmin d in rn. The, when I put c equal to zero, it said that there is no, con there is no feasible vector in the constraint, so I put c greater than or equal to zero. I have 
whatever this optimization problem is plus C 500 multiplied by C and then I have all these constraints picked from here and then I start solving the problem again using the same method. Okay, again my C 501 is going to be max of C 500 comma summation of mu k 500 star plus gamma mu j sum over all j. Yes? What does our mirror's rule for this approach even look like if it's going to wind up involving C? So you have you have to have f x k plus c p x k minus f x k plus d k, not plus d k plus s beta raised to m d k minus c p x k plus s beta raised to m d k is greater than or equal to whatever. you are not differentiating anything here you're just doing function evaluation yeah yeah right 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 and if c is very very large then the contribution of the objective function itself goes small and the contribution of the penalty term goes large so there is a lot of iterations that you need to do Okay. Oh, so here on this side you have sigma s beta raised to m dk transpose h dk. This h is right here. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so this would be the Armio's rule, and uh, you'll have to do multiple function evaluations in order to get an appropriate value of alpha k. Okay, so is the implementation somewhat clear? Okay, so this is how you would pick c at every point of time and uh, and get. And you are basically, by doing this iteration, you are essentially estimating the value of C such that it, it's greater than the sum of uh, the Lagrange multipliers corresponding to the inequality constraints. At this step, so what I'm saying is when, if you took C equal to zero, then the MATLAB returned that there is no feasible vector d and c that satisfies this constraint. So now you have to relax this constraint of c equal to zero. You have to take c greater than or equal to zero. Oh, there is no difference. But in the beginning, in the first time step, you don't know what value of c to take. So you just pick c equal to zero. So that way you get rid of any term that involves C, because this is the only term that involves C. Oh yeah, you cannot guarantee it, but now uh, what the book says is you are, you have a very good estimate of the sum, okay, and so there is no guarantee that you will be higher, but eventually you will become higher than the value of the sum of mu j star. Because as soon as you are close to x star, this, if, you're, if your xk is close to x star, then this is close to the sum, okay? And then you add this gamma term, which is positive, so you kind of make sure that it's above the threshold. Okay. Any other question? Yes. I just want to make sure I understand this um, Sure. So you solve for x naught, set the non-existent. 
Yes. And then you, you, you would, uh, you know, and then you take one of your, and the next iteration, you find um, C1, you solve for C1, is that right? Yeah. And then you go to the next iteration, you get So you solve for D1 and you update C1. So each iteration, you just update C, you get a higher value. Yes, yes. So you are iterating, it's like two points. Correct. Each iteration, you just have to Correct. Correct, yeah, that's right. Yes? Oh, how easy. So quadratic problem is certainly more complicated than linear programming problems, uh, but this can be solved pretty efficiently. So there are algorithms for solving quadratic problems of this type. Uh, we are not covering any of those algorithms in this class because we are covering either linear programming or general nonlinear optimization problems. But there are efficient methods for solving quadratic programs. But the complexity is higher than linear programs. So yes, if, if you had equality constraint, then you can solve this problem exactly. And in fact, projection theorem, you did exactly that. And then you did the assignment, which had equality constraint. So in equality constraint, you can solve it exactly. But this is inequality constraint, so you have a little bit of work to do here, okay? But yes, in your assignment two, I think, or assignment three, you essentially solved a quadratic program over a manifold, AX equal to B. So if we actually had a <coughs> final goal, new star, mm -hmm. or would we need to do that iteration no. process at all? No, oh. If you knew mu star from the very beginning, just keep, keep C equals the, sum of mu star, yeah. not equals, but c greater than sum of mu star. But the problem is, how would you know this, given a general problem? Well, uh, couldn't there be a, a phenomena where we have insight from sensitivity theorem um, into you know, the change of price and well, yeah, that we don't know its location? That's a good point. So yes, in some cases, you might have prior experience with the data. And so you kind of know where the sum of mu j star would lie. And so you can take certainly a value c greater than that. So for instance, in uh, again, going back to electricity market, you know that the rates are going to be about 15 cents per kilowatt hour. You can just pick c to be, I don't know, 500 cents per kilowatt hour, and then just essentially greater than the sum of mu j star. OK. So uh, the next topic is Lagrangian and primal dual. Oh, yeah, there is a question. You are saying these values, can it change? Right. Yes, they can still change. Because remember that your x1 will change this vector and x1 will change this constant. So your constraints have essentially changed. Your objective function has changed slightly because this. Will be equal to 0. Yeah. So it's likely that if mu j is 0, it will be 0 in the next iteration. Uh, or the other way, yeah, I don't think we can make any generic statement about what happens to mu j star. Yeah. It, d it really depends on how close to the boundary you are, how which direction you are going into and all that stuff. So it's really hard to make a generic statement that is going to hold under most, most circumstances. Okay. So Lagrangian methods uh, and primal dual interior point method. And uh, this is going to be a difficult class. Oh, it's already time. Okay. Uh, okay, it's not going to be a difficult, difficult class, but the next class is going to be a difficult <laughs> class. <laughs> okay. Lagrangian method 
and primal dual interior point method. Let, let, let me just do Lagrangian method. So I want to find or compute x bar and lambda bar such that gradient of x, l, x bar, lambda bar equal to 0, h, x bar equal to 0. OK, that's our goal. And, and you had this idea that, look, if I want to find a minimum for a constrained optimization problem, then I have to find a value of x bar and lambda bar that satisfies the first order necessary conditions for optimality. OK, and then you went to sleep. And the Lord of the Rings appeared in your dream. <laughs> and he came up with this algorithm. OK, he told you, try this algorithm and it will work. xk plus 1 equals xk minus alpha xk lambda k. And lambda k plus 1 equals Yeah, alpha being the same across all iterations. Okay, some small positive number. Okay, and then you tried it and it works, it kind of converges to x star, this converges to lambda star. So what would the value x star and lambda star satisfy? So we have x star equals x star minus alpha gradient of x, L x star, lambda star, which implies that gradient of x, L at x star, lambda star is equal to 0. And then we have lambda star equals to lambda star plus h, x star, which imply that h of x star is equal to 0. Okay, so if you run this algorithm and it converges, then you know that the point is going to satisfy the first order necessary condition for optimality. And you have to check, you st still check the second order sufficiency condition to ensure that x star or to, to uh, certify that x star is a local minimum. Yes? I, I understand how if this converges, it gives us a solution. Correct. But what at all can we say about when it will converge? Exactly. That's the next question. So now the question is, if it converges, it gives us a stationary point. How do we know that it converges? How do we know that this algorithm converges? How do we know, in general, that an algorithm that whoever proposed, whether it's uh, Tom, uh, Tom Riddle <laughs> or, or Tom Bombadil or Gandalf or yourself or your advisor, uh, how do you know that it converges? And one of the most powerful theorem in real analysis uh, is Banach contraction mapping theorem, which is essentially used to prove that an iterative method like this converges. Contraction mapping theorem. OK, so let's study what this, uh, what this theory is. So I have x, which is a subset of Rn. It's closed. I have a map P uh, from x to x. Uh, and 
T satisfies a condition that is known as the contraction condition. So T is a contraction. So what's the definition? So T from X to X is a contraction is a contraction map if there exist alpha in 0 comma 1. So 0 closed, 1 open such that norm of t x1 minus t x2 is less than equal to alpha x1 minus x2 for all x1, x2 in capital X. Yes? Isn't the remark about x being closed it's a a, oh, uh, uh, sorry, never mind. I was thinking subspace, not. No, no, it's closed. All we need is closeness. Okay. So T is a contraction map if for every alpha in zero one. So, so sorry, uh, T is a contraction map if there exists an alpha in 0, 1 such that the difference is less than or equal to alpha multiplied by the norm of the points itself. So let's look at a picture. So the picture is as follows. Here is my set X. Here is my set X. And here is a map T from X to X. I start with the point X1 here and a point X2 here. And I map it under the influence of T. So I get T X2, T X1. Okay, and I look at the distance between them, between these two points and I look at the distance between x1 and x2. What it says is there exists an alpha in 0, 1 such that this distance is less than or equal to alpha multiplied by this distance. Okay. So I'm not saying that the distance decreases. What I'm saying is distance decreases by a factor. Okay. So in the case of Rn, if your row of gradient of T, no, let me, let me introduce uh, this step a little bit later. So what I was saying is if the spectral radius of the gradient of T is less than 1, then it's a contraction map, okay? Uh, but uh, we'll, we'll come back to this point a little later. What norm for those statements or is it any norm? It is any norm, any norm. Uh, but certainly if you are in Rn, whatever norm you are considering in Rn is inherited by the norm uh, that you are considering over X and they're essentially restricted to using that norm. Now, I do have to mention that sometimes picking an appropriate norm makes a lot of sense. So sometimes your map may not be a contraction in one norm, but you change it to some other norm and it becomes a contraction. Okay, so it certainly is norm dependent, um, but uh, it doesn't matter which norm you are taking. It should satisfy those three conditions for being a norm. Yes. This one? Yeah. You could have an equ equality at some points, uh, or you could have equality everywhere, but. Uh, it, this is one value. This is just a real number between 0 and 1. So I don't know what you're saying by being one value. Oh, uh, 
it could have a range of values for alpha. No, I mean alpha doesn't depend on which direction you take. Okay, so let me give you an example. Let's say my, I have a mate, so t of x equals to 0 0.5000.8 multiplied by x, okay? If you take this uh, difference, what you have is 0 point, so let me just write it here. T of x1 minus T of x2 norm is always less than or equal to 0 0.8 x1 minus x2. Okay, so even though you're, you're right in saying that if your x was just, uh, it was zero in the bottom and it was some number in the top, then this will be 0 0.5. But if you're looking at the whole space, then this will be 0 0.8. Okay, and it's a, it is satisfied for 0 0.5 value as well. So no matter which direction you go. What can you say about the inverse? Of inverse of what? Of the map. The t? T. Oh, t may not be invertible. If it was. Uh, doesn't mean anything. I don't know how it would help you. I mean, it's not going to help you with this Banach contraction mapping theorem. Okay. So now I'm, uh, the time is over, so next class, be prepared, have a lot of coffee before you come to the class. <laughs>